46. I just read only two verses there. Give me your undivided attention. Verse 9 and 10. Remember the former things of old. For I am God and there is none else. There is only one God. There is no other God. This God do not have a deputy. He does not consult to anybody. He does whatsoever he will according to his purpose. And Bible says many are the counsels in a man's heart. But it's only the purpose of God that will prevail. For I am God. There is none else for an emphasis. I am God. There is none like me. Hallelujah. Declaring the end from the beginning. From the ancient things. Things that are not yet done. Saying, my counsel shall stand. And I will do my pleasure. We started this morning by saying the theme of our gathering is how to find a balance between our position in a marketplace and as a citizens of the kingdom of God. And I want to take a title for this second section. And my title is How to Face the Future with Fearless Confidence. My inspiration for this little exhortation is character and character and integrity is one of the keys. In the morning, we read Matthew chapter 16, verse 18 and 19, where Jesus spoke to his disciples and said that. Peter, he asked the disciples, who do you say that I am? They were gazing. He said, this, forget about gazing work. Tell me yourself, who do you believe that I am? Because they don't know. And you cannot do more than what you know. Knowledge, Bible says my people perish for lack of knowledge. Then in that midst of the question, the thunder begin to light. And the sound, it seems flashes. And Peter spoke, not by intellectual conception, but he heard from his theophany, thou art Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus knew clearly that Peter didn't learn this in school. The theology school did not taught it because they thought they are, that he's second or the third person in God. But he, when he said that, he said, Peter, Upon this rock, the rock is not Peter. The rock is not church. The rock is the spiritual revelation of who Christ is. I will build my church. God cannot build his church on a man that is unstable like Peter who denied him. No, he's not built on a man. But on who Christ is, the kingdom of hell will not prevail. Not prevail means he's going to come against it, but the kingdom is powerful than every force. The kingdom is unstoppable. The kingdom can never be quenched. It doesn't matter the forces that come against it. So, you can face your future with fearless confidence. Hallelujah! Everyone wants to succeed. Nobody wants to fail in life. Let me also emphasize that success in life is predictable. Also, I want to remind you that failure is. You can predict failure and success, and that is, and, and there is the reason why. The reason why you can do that is because. Everything God created in life was designed and created to function by laws. Therefore, 
Lord, Lord, make life predictable. Life, life, laws make life simple. That means that God designed everything in life to function by laws. Therefore, he designed it to be successful. Look at this scripture we, we read. Many of us, I told them in the morning that the problem we have in this age we are living is a problem of identity. Where people don't, are not clear who they are. Church, listen to me. God is not experimenting with you. Actually, what this, let's open that place again. But I want you to just emphasize it a little bit and then we can take the question and answer. What God is saying is that I never start without finishing. You didn't hear me. Your life is not an experiment. I sell automobile. Before BMW, Jaguar, Land Rover, Rolls Royce, Ford, before we bring car in the showroom, they build the car. When they have tested the car before they put their label, the label is the last thing they put in the car. Without label, they take this car in the hottest part of this world and flood the car. They take it in the coolest part of this earth. They take it in the desert. Take this car through different tests and processes. If they have any reason to go back for engineering, they do. But when they are satisfied that this car will deliver what they have promised, they put their label on it. Hallelujah! Amen! That time, they will call those of us who are dealers to come and have a test drive. To come and witness that what they promise, this car will deliver. God said, I am God. Remember the former things of old. I am God. There is none else. I have no second person. Nobody decides for me. Whatever I decide is final. But let me tell you, I'm not about to experiment with you. When I finish, I back up. Then I ask you to start. Hallelujah. So what you are called into, it's not God is not trying to test you. God is taking you to what has been tested. Hallelujah. God wants you to just come and live the life that he has tested. Because he's God who knew the end from the beginning. So you have to face life with fierce confidence. Confidence is everything about life. Don't ask me, does that mean you don't have fear? No, fear is an incubator. Fear is necessary for courage to exist. Hallelujah. So, whenever you have fear, that means God is building you to express courage. Because courage is not an absence of fear. It's ability to act in the face of danger. Hallelujah. But people of faith must take a step of faith. If I perish, I perish. But I assure you, when your faith is based on this word, victory is guaranteed to you. Because God who created you, had finished you, test you, know what you can produce, and then gave you a manual. When the Ford or BMW or Rolls Royce or Jaguar finished building the car, they give a manual. The manual is how to get the best out of the product. You don't need to experiment with that product. When you take the manual and you read the manual, then you can make a demand on the product to deliver what is in the manual. But the problem is that many of us don't want to read the manual. We believe we know everything and we can demand on it and then we started to experiment with that product and they will not deliver to us. This manual of life in Joshua chapter 1, verse 7 said, this book of life, 
law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night. When you do that, then the scripture said in verse 8, everything will submit to you. Thou shalt make thy way. It didn't say, then your uncle shall make your way. It didn't say, then Tunubu shall make your way. It didn't say, then Nigeria economy. No, thou shalt make thy way, what? Prosperous. Hallelujah. And you will have what? Good success. A qualified seat. Hallelujah. Good one. God promised to you. But the knowledge to get there comes from the manual. So if you really want to succeed in life, let this manual become your companion. Take this manual, read it left and right. Because in the morning we talked about the keys of the kingdom. Matthew 16, 19 says, I will give you the keys, plural word, not one key. Keys. One of the keys of life, to unlock life, is forgiveness. But Christians can live with bitterness and unforgiveness and they are fasting praying. They tell him, God is saying, release him. He said, I can never release him. If this is what it takes, I remain where I am. You are not holding anybody. If you drink a poison and expecting me to die, you are making a mistake. Because the poison will kill you. It's you that drink the poison that need to be purged. So bitterness and hatred is a poison. So there are laws you must understand. That's why I said everything in life is based on law. Isaiah 46 that we have read said that the mysteries of life, God is, God is just trying to get you to do what has already been proven that has been tested. The greatest mystery in life is that your destiny was chosen by God. But its fulfillment is decided by you. You can make a note on that and say that Brother Cosma says so. The greatest mystery in life is that your destiny was chosen by God, but its fulfillment is decided by you. And I'm going to say it again. The greatest mystery of life is that your destiny was chosen by God, but its fulfillment is decided by you. How? Your destiny is chosen by God, but its fulfillment decided by you. That's a heavy responsibility on you. In other words, God has already completed your life and has already written a book on you and finished your journey and you are already successful but making it to the end of that destiny is a choice and decision that you have to make. It's like a parent who can pay for his son or daughter who want to read medicine. That child is already predestinated to be a doctor. But whether that child become a doctor or not is entirely dependent upon that child. Because what is stopping between that child and a, and a college of medicine is that child's ability to learn. So you say, I want to be a doctor. The next question comes to your mind is how do they use mouth to become a doctor? In Ipo language, we said, na he jiao no eighteen years no fe. Yoruba people say, obeto da oholokwa. So, you don't use mouth to do this thing. Your analytic thinking creak in. How? It's a conversation you are going to make with yourself. And you begin to speak to yourself. I have to be good in five science subjects. I have to be good in mass. I have to be good in extra mass. I have to be good in English. I have to be good in biology. I have to be good in, uh, in uh, 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 you know, all the science subjects. Fine, you don't have it, but you have identified it. Self-conversation. Then you look for teacher. That subject you think is the most difficult subject. When you get the keys of it, you are, it will be exciting to you. You start to experiment, you know, you begin to break it. Now, if your father can pay for you to be a doctor, and he has paid your school fees, he's expecting a doctor to come back. But you can go to school. 
and join a gang and fool around with all the renegades, at the end of the day, you will not graduate. It's not because you are not destined to be a doctor, but because you did not put the, follow the principle to become a doctor. Somebody said, but where is the place of grace? I say grace is an enablement. Grace is not a disgrace. Grace is not that you are not going to do anything. Two smart boys had an elderly man in their village they call an oracle who knows everything. And they say, we are going to make a fool of this oracle. And they got a bird and put it behind their back and went to the oracle and said, we want you to decode this mystery to us. We have a bird behind us and we want to know whether this bird is alive or dead. And they were giggling. The oracle also started laughing. And the children said, no, we want you to tell us. They have proposed in their heart, we are going to make a fool out of this man. If you ever tell us that this bird is alive, we will squeeze the bird. It will be dead and we will show him a dead bird. If he tell us that this bird is dead, we will show him a live bird. So they believe they can, wait, they can wish. When they were laughing, the oracle himself started laughing. They said, what are you laughing? Tell us, we want to know. The man said, very simple. Whether this bird is alive or dead is up to you. That is the destiny. If you like, kill that bird. If you like, leave it alive. So, it's not about anybody making decision for you. But what you do, if God planned that you will be a robot, then he will not have given you a will. Because he said, I said before your life and death. But you need to make a choice whether you want to live or die. So if you like, God planned everything in life. He made fish to live in the water. Any day, fish begin to complain. Why do they keep me in this pond? I don't like this pond. They should get me out of this pond. And he jumped out of that pond. That fish is dead on arrival. Because his life is only determined in the pond. He has no choice about it. That's where his life is. He, can, he only pray if somebody can put him back inside that pond. Hallelujah! When you doubt the word of God and get out of the promise, you are dead on arrival. You don't need to kill a plant. Just remove it out of the root. The plant is dead. Because its life is on the soil. So if you want to live and make anything meaningful in life, you go back to your origin. This is your source. God bless you. I can take your questions. Okay. The first question here is, of course, you understand, you know, what, what the meeting is about, how to balance um, su success in the marketplace and ministry, right. how to strike a balance. And, of, and you know this, you know, no better person to handle this topic successfully than the one who has exceptionally proven it. Um, okay, please, let's start with that video clip. Chinedu. Let's start. This is Dr. Cosmos Madika Ministry. Okay, please stop there. So I, I, I saw this, I think about a year ago or so, and then I sent him a message. We chatted about it, and I was asking, you know, how do you find time to still remain uh, relevant in the harvest field, that is, in soul winning, while you are successfully pursuing or rather, you know, leading multi-billionaire uh, companies? Because you've heard people say, um, I'm afraid if I get so committed, I won't have time for my business. Or if I get so committed, you know, um, I don't know what's going to happen to my career. But here with us this morning is a man 
who in every sense of the word is successful in the marketplace and has actively served God for almost five decades. Almost five decades, actively. So, the first question, Dr. Cosmas, is, somebody asks, how do I balance time spent on business demands with ministry? I can simply tell you, um, it's about having clarity of who you are, which kingdom you are serving. If you understand clearly that you are a citizen of the kingdom of God, um, when purpose is not known in life, definitely abuse will become inevitable. Um, we just remove the pulpit. If you don't know, okay, I'm sitting in a seat here. You know, I can stand on this seat. Yeah. I can put a food on this seat. Yeah. Anything I can put on it, it will not complain. But if I do anything outside of sitting on this seat, I'm abusing the seat. Because that is not the purpose for which it's made. When you don't know the purpose of your life, you will abuse it. Many people get into marriage. They don't know the purpose of marriage. That's why there's marriage abuse. Because some people thought marriage is to make children. So once they get married, the first two years or one, a child did not come. The man is either abused the wife or the woman will begin to tell man, you know, feed give woman belly. Story, all kind of things started to happen because they enter into it. You must have heard about child abuse. People have children without knowing the purpose of having a, a child. So if you're a Christian, you need to ask yourself, what is the purpose of my existence? Your purpose here is nothing but to serve God's purpose. You are a, you are a, represent, there's a representation by predestination upon you. You are here for only one reason. If you are a child of God. Because if you are truly a child of God, you didn't just get internal life. Internal life is not something you receive. It's something that, that you, have, you, have, you are born into. The day you come to Christ is just the day you recognize it. That's not the day you were saved. You have always been saved, but you never recognize it. So if you have this understanding that you come here to show God to your generation, then everything you are doing have to line up with the kingdom purpose. And the kingdom purpose is to glorify God through your life. Everything you do, if God is not taking glory on it. So your business, your career, they are not in conflict with you. They are only there to serve the purpose of God. So the first thing that comes is what is God's will in the things I'm doing. I've never seen God owe any man. I've never seen any man who, who, who planted in God's vineyard that lack. So you line your life up. That's why I tell you everything in life is predicted to function by law. You are sitting on the seat where you sat now because your law of gravity kept you here. If you go beyond the sound barrier on the atmosphere, you will not sit, you will float. But there is a law that control him. But many of us don't like to hear this law. No. There is law that controls everything. So if you're a Christian, you got to know, have a clarity. The only reason why you are here is to promote the kingdom of God. Every other thing is secondary. And when that question is answered, then conflict over your business. But if you want to hear from me as a testimony, my boss punished me, gave me 200 naira in 1976 because I went to church to fast for three days on Monday. I just turned 15 and I was about to turn 15. And he felt, why should you close the shop? I 
out of anger that evening, he asked me to come with my senior brother and he counted 200 naira and gave me. And I said, uncle, I serve you well. I never stole from you. This is not how to settle boys. I'm not the first boy who did apprentice. Why would you give me 200 naira as my stewardship for five years and a half? He said, so that you can go and pray so that God will prosper you. I looked at my uncle eyeball to eyeball in the presence of my senior brother. My uncle is my mother's junior brother. I said, uncle, I serve you well. If you like, make a note that I say this to you. Five years from today, if you heard who I am, your head will be spinning. He shook him. He moved his seat. He said, well, I know you will succeed. I said, thank you very much because that is the blessing I needed from you. Now, please listen to me. I say to my uncle, God hardened the heart of Pharaoh that he might show his might in the land of Egypt. Where am I coming from? Principle from the word of God. Because it was the same thing Jesus said in Matthew 16. There will be oppositions. This will come against the purpose of this kingdom. But they will not survive. That's right. Please remember, this young boy, his father died when he was four years. He had no formal education. The person sitting here talking to you did not go beyond a four-corner world they call school, beyond elementary three, third grade. But I took the principle I had in this world. I lived my life with it. Everything I find here. When you put God first, go and check till today. No business appointment that will make me miss church service. Mm. Wednesday, Friday prayer meeting, Sunday, no. If you put, if you make an appointment for me on a service day, I tell you I will not honor it. Mm. Please understand that I am doing this in honor to God. Mm. It is the first opportunity for me to minister to you if you want to hear. Mm. Nobody better with God that has ever fell. The thing that has made many of us run into problem is that we approach God like a deep water. Let me try this deep sea mm. with one leg. If it becomes too deep, I will take the second leg. No, you jump inside it. If I perish, I perish. You will say, I'm teaching you fanaticism and all of that. God bless you, but that is the way I have applied it in my life and it worked for me. From 15 years, I wore the badge. Jesus is alive today. Till today, you see me with Jesus. Jesus is Lord. I wear that badge in Dubai, in Japan. When, when Atiku was, I went to go and see Atiku, I wear it. I wore it in Bahrain, everywhere. People, sometimes people meet me and said, Jesus. I tell them I'm not Jesus. <laughs> that Jesus is my Lord. He can trigger me from then. I will start witnessing to him. People are afraid of their faith. Some of them close their hand. When I was in the, in the board of Access Bank, I will put this badge. When they are taking picture for the board, they cut, they cut it so that they don't put it so that this does not affect the, the company. Then I put it at my legs. <laughs> Let them cut my head. <laughs> when I notice in two pages that, that they cut it, I take it up here. So let them only show my neck. <laughs> and I served in that board for 12 years. And I was the chairman of credit committee for 12 years. And I can smell credit. With my third grade education, I brought to the board what, no, no, what they did not, what they don't teach in Harvard. They call it street smart. Everybody there have BAC, MSC, this, this, this. Go and check. X and, uh, uh, KPMG will come and audit us. We are 14-man board. Everybody in the board will audit each other. To avoid prejudice, I wouldn't know what Habert says about me. Habert will not know what I said about him. 
Ike will not know what I says. I will, we go through that, KPMG collect it and give us the result. I've never gone beyond the most third person that contribute to the board with my elementary three degree. Where did that knowledge come from? When Pharaoh, when Joseph went to Egypt and tell Pharaoh what to do to avert poverty, Pharaoh knew that University of Egypt do not have that curriculum. When knowledge is downloaded in you, Deuteronomy chapter 8, the one verse, it said, I am God who gives you power to create wealth. That means knowledge, because there are many eyes that can look, but there are very few eyes can see. A man without a vision is worse than a man without an eyes. And vision comes from God. And the person who gives you vision will make provision. Because there's no vision without provision. The man that gives that will provide the pro in the vision. So everything you are looking for is in the kingdom. If you want good health, it's in the kingdom. You want prosperity, it's in the kingdom. You want success, it's in the kingdom. But you need to come kingdom way. You are not coming your own way. Coming your own way is making God in your own image. God that is under your back and call. You can tell him, stand up, do this and do that. You come and accept the kingdom way. That means you have no second thought coming. God bless you. Hallelujah. Are you being blessed at all? Are you being blessed? He said he has never missed a service. Not even Wednesday service. Because of business. And yet he's not poor. And yet his business is not going down. I also never miss a prayer meeting. Because that's where we know how many people that are serious. Many times, you don't know how serious a church is until you visit their prayer meeting. Mm. You get to church where there are 5,000 people. When it comes to prayer meeting, there's only 50 people. They think those other people that come for prayer meeting are jobless people who has nothing to do. They call them intercessors. Where did you find them that in the Bible? Every one of Jesus said, no, he didn't say, if you will pray. He said, when? That means he knew you are going to do this thing that is called prayer. So we use prayer meeting to judge the level of spirituality of the people in the church. Because many people will come for, you know, morning service on Sunday and come to this. Listen, Jesus said in St. Matthew chapter 4, verse, he said, anyone who hears this word of mine and put them into practice, listen to me, practice is a lifestyle. It's not what you do once. Because if I tell you, if you pray, God will bless you, and you pray once, you applied prayer, but you did not practice. If I tell you, you exercise, you are God good at, and you run the whole day and fell sick, the next six months you never exercise. You did not, you, you apply exercise, but you did not practice. The emphasis is anyone who practice these sayings of mine. Practice means continuous doing a lifestyle. He's not looking for a life, he's looking for a lifestyle. Put your hands together for Jesus. This is living, breathing example that Matthew 6.33 walks. It says, seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these other things shall be added. Tell your neighbor it works. It works. I mean, to be able to sit and say, I have never missed a service, not even a prayer meeting. And he said something in the first service. He said, I'm not a wealthy man who, who came to Christ. I'm a Christian who became wealthy. So it's not because God blessed me and I decided to just know. I walked into Christian. I became a Christian 
and then gave myself wholly to him and he began to raise me. That's just the bottom line. And it's not because I'm smarter than every one of you. I'm the most dullest person here. The only thing is that I understood law better than you. I knew principle and I submitted myself to it. Success is about knowing principle and submitting to that principle. You cannot put your hand on the fire and don't expect it to burn you. Fire did not burn you. You burn yourself. Okay. Someone asked here, he said, as an individual with a white collar job who also has heavy pain side hustles that even pays more than the nine to five, how do I know the right time to quit? There's no formula. There's no written script. But I encourage you to deploy yourself. Because if you don't deploy yourself, somebody is going to employ you. And deploying yourself means when you get back in the evening, stop watching television or WhatsApping message. Nobody gets in the book of record, a Guinness book of record, because they WhatsApp the first message on return <laughs> mail. It's, it's people who are 80 years should be doing those things. But some people that are 25, 30 years are still, listen to me, if you are not in my contact, I don't open your mail. When it's 1,000, I delete it. That's how I read it. Because I don't have television in my house. From 25 years, my wife and I, I say, honey, can we agree? We don't need television in this house. She said, yes. We raised five kids without television. Till today, it's not a doctrine. I'm not telling you it's a doctrine. You need to decide what works for you. But let me tell you, if you are jumping up, you are paying price. If you are running, you are paying price. If you sit in one place and doing nothing, you may be paying the greatest price. Life is about price. You got to pay. Everything you do have a price. And when you waste your time, your time is your life. Many of us sit comfortable in a white collar pay job. I may say something you may not like. Salary is a medicine for poverty, but it doesn't cure it. If you have diabetes and keep your insulin in a regular basis, you will live a normal life. But as soon as you stop that insulin, the sickness comes back. So you enjoy it until your day of retirement come. Deploy yourself. Deploying yourself means even when you have a paid job, work hard to get into the management where you share from the profit of the company. Where they recognize you can't live your life on a paycheck. When you come back in the evening, Instead of watching television, looking for message to end, begin to, because every one of us are born with a gift. There's something God deposited in you that the world is waiting for. So, in that deployment, when you look at that, actually, God created a man to be a manager. The motivation of creating a human being is somebody to manage. That's why, if you read Genesis 2-4, the Bible says nothing grew. There was... The place, the way it is of like Genesis 2, it's like, rock all over the place. But once God created a man, there's vegetation coming. And he took his son. Walk is not a cause. Walk is spiritual. Put the man in the garden to dress it, to protect it. So, a walk, your walk is what will make you in life. Your walk is what you are born to do. Your job pay you for what you do. But your work is what makes you wealthy and get you advanced in prosperity. You are going to job and do everything you do. They pay you for the things you do. But your work will keep you in that medication of high blood pressure 
But any day you leave that high blood pressure, that sickness comes back if you are hypertensive. But if you really want to be free from that high blood pressure, then you should deploy yourself and find your work. There's a different thing between your work and your job. They are not the same. Don't confuse them. Your work is the reason why you were born. Your purpose, why God sent you on earth. If you discover it, you discover your wealth. Hallelujah. If you don't deploy yourself, somebody will employ you. And you remain employed forever. So you have to be thinking of how to deploy yourself if you are not already deploying yourself. In other words, salary job can never make you rich. Are you here? Is somebody here? Salary job. Tell your neighbor, salary job cannot make you rich. Wise up. Yeah. Can you imagine if he was earning salary, how much would he be paid? Especially, especially with a primary three certificate. I'm not employable with it. <laughs> I, I, just, I just do casual level. <laughs> Nobody will put you in it. So At <laughs> all. Praise the name and, of Jesus. And some of my colleagues are still driving Okada at, seven, at uh, 66. Wow. Yeah. But I just refuse to, to do that. So not palande. Are you here? Some of his colleagues are still on bike. Okada. At 66. First of all, do you even believe he's up to 66? I'm not yet that. I'll be that on December 24. This year. 66. Do you see the way he was jumping? He jumped from here down. I, I was like, God, have mercy. Balanced life. Balanced life. Balanced life. Do, do, you, do you want to live a balanced life? Where every area of your life is together, including your physical health. That's correct. If you mismanage your health, you will lose it. If you mismanage your spouse, you lose it. You lose your husband or wife. Anything, God created a man to be a manager. Anything you mismanage, you lose. God knew resources are not in plenty supply. He's not a wasteful God. He wants you to deploy resources in a sustainable manner. That's why after Jesus fed 5,000 men and women out of two pieces, he said, let nothing be wasted. Yes. Pick the crops on the ground. Why is the God of creation looking for the crops that is in the ground? When, when he could take two fish and fed 5,000, each of those disciples went home with a basket of that 12, of, of, because, of that crop and the ground. Because when you walk, you have to, there is reward for every labor. The next question here, how do I start a business idea with what I have, but it's not enough and no one to help me? Start with what you have. Let me tell you this confidently and believe that I say so. Nobody, to the best of my knowledge, that decide to succeed in life and willing to pay the price of success that have not seen succeeded. The truth is that everybody wants to be successful, but they are not willing to pay the price of success. Because there are things you need to do to be successful. They don't use mouth to be successful. If you want to be successful, I started a business with 200 naira. God bless the memory of my wife. She's not here. If you and ask her, when we started, because we planned to go somewhere, these things are based on law. My wife wants to cook soup. I said, honey, can you make, give me a list? She will make a list, oil, pepper, salt, vegetable. I'll give her money. I keep lists. <laughs> she didn't know I kept lists. Three weeks later or two weeks later, my wife said, the soup is finished. We are going to cook. I said, give me a list. She make a list. I'll take the list and compare the last list. 
I saw oil. I said, honey, you bought oil last week. Why are you writing oil again? It's oil Coca-Cola that she has drank in it. But it's economics. Because she, from her parents and family, his senior brother was a medical doctor. His father worked for UAC. They own hospital. So, from my poor background, we call them Ndo Kutelinu Tolegu. People who do not know how to manage resources. So I taught my wife the discipline of managing resources by checking the list. She had to explain, honey, we cook young vegetable last week. You know, young vegetable takes a lot of oil. That's why the oil has finished. Then I'll bring money for the oil. That's how we started. But that lady grew to a point she can sign a check of 10 billion naira alone and own a credit card that can draw $1 million. But she started by doing this. She jumped boss in this Lagos. She taught in Jaconde school. She don't even know how to swim, but she had to pass through canal with uh, uh, this boat to go to school. They have removed her lapa and my two when we are coming from Christian Pentecostal Mission, where is our church? And I was waiting, they have, they have taken it. So, we are, we are not dropped from heaven. If you have gone through hardship, actually God sent me ahead of every one of you to dismantle all your unbelief. Every reason you have why you should not be successful. I was not born costaris. If you have been financially embarrassed, I knew what financial embarrassment was all about. I've all and Lord. The worst thing that happened to you is to owe an angry landlord. One day, one day, I sat, I was in the store. I sat there, Justice Ubezo are not coming. I sit like this under the counter. That thing they call showroom because I have not paid him. He came and asked the boy, where is customers? My boy said, it's not there. It's okay if it's not there. Get out, let me lock the job. When I had the job, I said, okay, oh, I'm here. He said, come out. I thought he would change his mind. He brought me out and locked up the shop. <laughs> so there's nothing you are going through. The Bible said there's nothing new under the sun. When you go through such embarrassment, you will know how to deploy the sources if you ever have it. Because many of us are saying uh, things are hard. It's because you are living in luxury. You haven't, you haven't got through hardship. Hardship is an incubator opportunity. For you to think. When you are hungry without food, you, you will learn invention. You will become inv you will you will become inv you will you begin to invent things how to eat. During the civil war, there were no farm, so we couldn't get vegetable. But everything that had leave if it's vegetable, what do we do? We get a goat, we give you the thing and watch for you, see if you can die. If the goat didn't die six hours after that, it become a vegetable, we ate it. Wow. Do you still have excuses? Do you still have excuses? Will you succeed? Will you succeed? In spite of the odds, in spite of the economy, will you succeed? Okay, another question. How do I integrate biblical principle into my business decisions? By simply reading the Bible and submitting yourself to the word. Let the, you see, God is, God is infinite when he has not spoken. When God speaks, his word became a law to him. That's why I say by two immutable things, in which it is impossible for God to lie. Psalm 1 that he said, I set my word above my name. I take literally every promise you find in this word. Rest your soul on it. When God speaks, he will back his word. So, Jesus said in St. John chapter 14, verse 15, If you love me, keep my commandments. 
Why are you telling um, somebody you love him? If I ask you to stand up, you sit down. If he tells you to stand up, you start running. And the next minute, you tell him, I love you. It's like women telling their husband, I love you. And the husband tells you anything, you argue over it. The thing men interpret as love is reverence, respect. It's women that, that has emotion. You need to tell her 1,000 times you love her, and she wants it 1,001 times. Don't tell me you love me when I tell you to do something. You don't do what I tell you to do. Submit to obedience. There's no magic to it. Let God know you have a heart that is receptive. Lord, I will obey your word. At your command, oh Lord, I do this. And you will see things change in your life. No magic. Obedience. Scripture says if you are willing and obedient, you eat the good of the land. The next question, what are the consequences of compromising my values for business success? It's very simple. Like I told you, if you put your, your hand in the fire, it will burn you. It, it's unfortunate that we live, the, there are like new model Christianity. But unfortunately, God has no old model or new model. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. What he was done in the Bible days can be done today. If anybody meet the condition on which God opened the blind person in the Bible day, he's obligated to open another blind eye today. Otherwise, he made a mistake when he opened the first person. So he never changed. So you, you don't need to compromise. The gospel that brought me to be a Christian was, I was working for my uncle, sleeping in a shop in 88 Griffith Street in Oyimbo bus stop. One Olu was a mechanic who came to bypass in our shop. And uh, when he bought the pass, I said, Olu, how much will I write? He said, why are you asking me? I said, some mechanic come here and tell us to inflate the price. They dash us money. He said, don't you know it was wrong? I said, I don't know. When we wrote that, he dashed us some money. He said, you shouldn't do that. Olu invited me for Monday Bible study of Brother Kumuyi, when he was a lecturer in uh, Unilag. And Adegoye was also a lecturer. At the dead end of Obitemeta, Adegoye would have morning devotion every morning. That was the first time I heard about anything Christianity. One week from then, my boss took me to transfer me to Joss. I, did, I wasn't, I, did, I, was, I, I was not, I, I couldn't say I made commitment to Christ, but I've had something that let me know there's more to it than my Catholic background that gave me. It was at Sokoto that I saw a young man. His name is Adolphus. He was, he was also an apprentice like us. But his life is different. You, you don't, he, he never preached to me. But let me tell you, there are deeps in you if you're a son of God calling after a deep. And if there's a deep in you calling after a deep, there's a deep to respond to it. I watch the quiet and gentle disposition about this guy. Of my own vision, I say, Adol, why are you different than the rest of us? I, I want you to be honest. We, we are doing apprenticeship. We, we, we grumble. We cause. We are rough. We, you, there's this gentle disposition of you that I like. He said, can I excuse him? The store where he is is a shop like this at the back of his bedroom. He went there and now that he didn't know, I followed him, I followed like this. And I look, the guy was kneeling down, praying. Before he came out to talk to me, I knew this guy was in another level of life, that I am not where he is. My respect for him went so high, and I wanted what he had. That was the first time the gospel was spoke to me. And he, he gave me a gift of a white Bible from which I learned to lead this grammar had tortured me. My mother never spoke grammar to me. I stopped in elementary three. I am good at calculating mathematics. When it comes to the day of dictation, I try to go late in the school. <laughs> because English is so complicated, they change the goalposts. They say, K is silent in knife. If he's silent, what is he doing there? 
Why don't you take it out? So we can say knife and no. It's too complicated. They tell you this is silent. Why if you are silent, what is he doing there? Remove it now. They start number and say first, second, third, fourth, fifth. Why didn't you say one, two, third, fourth, fifth? Well, then we become it's, it's simple. So we do the whole thing by the same thing. But they keep on changing. They tell you if you call people that you cannot put S and then you put papers, they say you are speaking wrong English. And they tell you S make words plural. So too complicated. Hallelujah. And some of us pride ourselves about it and thought that is what education was. Because you can speak impeccable English. They asked Henry Ford, who is educated. Henry Ford said, an educated man or a woman is a person that will organize his thought into productivity. Before then, you are a great intellectual, but you are not educated. I believe I'm one of the most educated person in the face of the earth because I'm able to organize my thought. And if you don't like my education, you cannot quarrel with my results. Hallelujah. What role does faith play in overcoming business challenges? Faith plays a very important role. Let me say you have three, you require three things to succeed. Number one is a vision. You are the first believer of your vision. Yes, sir. You don't, many times, even your wife or your husband will doubt your vision. Nobody will believe in you except you believe in yourself. You are the first believer of yourself. You will see the destination, the end of the destination, but all the route that will take you there, you may not see because it's a journey of a voyage and that's what uh, vision is. The second thing you require is faith to believe in your vision. Nobody should talk you out of it. And you can be violent about it. And I'll give you a testimony now. And the third thing you require is courage. Courage, like I said in the morning, is not an absence of fear. It's the ability to act in the face of danger. If I perish, I perish. Listen. At 15 years old, I knew I'm going to be successful. I wrote five things I want to accomplish before I turn 25. Because I read this Bible, Habakkuk 2.20. If you have a vision, write it down. Everything you claim you believe will be subjected to test for authenticity. I wrote down that by 18, I want to live in three bedrooms apartment of my own. By 20, I want to take a lady to altar as my wife. By 21, I want to have a son. By 23, I want to own my own car. And by 25, I want to be a millionaire. I took it and placed it on the wall of my bed. When I finish business in the day, I come back. I look at these five things. After I pray, I looked at them, internalized them, and go to bed. So when I sleep, I saw myself in Japan. I saw myself carrying container. I saw myself discussing with white people. Listen, because this Bible, I tell you, is a book of law. It's the constitution of the Christians. Whatever is pure, whatever is of good report, whatever is honest, Think on these things. The problem many of you have, with utmost due respect, you watch too much Nigerian home movie where people are sucking blood, where people are making love. If you watch pornography, are you surprised that the demon are coming to make love to you when you are sleeping? Because it's 
what you feed yourself that comes back to you. So, but if you, these are the things that dominate you and you sleep, those are things that come back. When I get up in the morning, after praying, before I go out, I go back again. I look at those things from beginning to the end. Then I go. If you meet me, you are talking to me. You don't know the way my head is marking. Everything you are saying is that I take you and I put you inside that place. If you do not fall in there, I cut you off. People start saying, I am too proud. I am too arrogant. No, I have a vision. I'm not proud. I am in prison to my vision. Anything that is contrary to it is a distraction. That's why you must have reason for existence. So, this thing controlled me to the point, through to the fact, by the time I was 18 years, I was living in three bedrooms apartment of my own. My senior brother is still with my mother. I held from Nehu, but I was living in Nehu as a tenant because I have plans for my life. And it's not a classroom work because you are my senior, then I have to queue behind you. No. When you have a vision, you break tradition. I broke, I broke tradition. The tradition in my village is that the first boy have to get married. You need to build a house before you get married. But because by 15, I started feeling like a man. And I don't want this boy, girl, flinting because I know it will be a distraction to where I want to go in life. So I set my goals clear. We had a church that is small. Our church is not bigger than this pulpit from there to here. Our choir is just like where this musician is. But in this small, this small group, when they sing, one voice stands distant from all of them. I didn't have all the money in my pocket. I raised my left hand up. I said, Lord, I claim her in the name of Jesus Christ. There are many wealthy brothers there. We are all online. I use my faith and knock them all out. Sisters, listen to me. And I think I've said this here before. The problem you have is because you lack this principle. You don't know. You don't ask the correct question. When a man tells you, I want to, I said, do you love me? If the man didn't love you, he will not tell you. Ask the man, where are you taking me to? Yeah. Do you love me? It's a wrong question. Yeah. Where are you taking me to? Is what plan do you have for yeah. life? Your Share your life with you. Yeah. I told my wife, I said, by, she asked me, where are you taking me to? I said, by 20, we will be here. By 21, we'll have a son. By 23, we'll have a car. She hold my left hand and said, we'll do it together. Hey. On September 23rd, 1978, I took charity to altar. So if you, are, if you are 44 years here, I could be your father. I've been married for 46 years. I took her to altar. It's not without pain. Because I have aimed high. My family, there was no graduate in my family. Their family has produced two doctors. Own hospital. When I told my mother that this is a lady I want to marry, say good luck. Because you, you always don't know your size. You always am too high. You are going to Ike Deco family. Their name actually is Ike Deco. He said you don't know where you belong. I got a gun shot for it. His uncle shot me. Not joke, real gun. And said if you see me in the family. Because if you think my grammar is bad today, you need to think what it was 40 something years ago. I used cutlass to cut it. It was Worcester. Then, 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 then they said, they said. But this lady was a visionary lady. He could see beyond that. I took her to altar. Did the thing husband did to their wife. But God knew that these two babies cannot be making baby. He shot the womb. Our first child came at 26. I pursue other vision. Next time when I come, I'll bring the camel. I will bring, I'll put it in so you can see. By 22, I passed Oka Road by Mandela's in Onisha. I saw a Passat car, blue color, wagon. 
I negotiated it with 3,000 kilometers, and I closed a deal and own a car by 22. I own my own car, not 23. I beat it by one year. And when I show you the label, you see it. In the front of it, Jesus is coming soon. Jesus is alive today. I put the badge of Jesus left and right on that car. I used to drive from Newe to Benin to have one service at Church of God Mission. But Abenson was still alive then. If you need to hear this song, then say, go to Church of God yeah, Mission. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let them yeah. sing it. Yeah. You see the angels come down. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I well, go there, did all of that. Stay with men of God who, but the Benson told me God put oil in Nigeria because of him. We went to UNN. He told me, he put back at my said, Cosmos, give these children 10,000 naira. 10,000, you need Ben, 2,000 naira for me, or I don't know whether 10,000 naira. It was like 100 million of it. It was so heavy, but I did. I followed this principle. One day, I have this plan. When this thing comes upon me, because the Bible says in the last day, young men should see vision. A man without vision is worse than a man with, with sight. Without sight. Young, without sight. Young men will see vision. The elderly, the young lady, the, the husband will prophesy. And the old men will dream dream. What is a dream? What you wish could be done, you are too old now for it to be done. You look for a young man and hand it over and say, make it a vision. When in a difficult time, that's why people need to share their vision with their spouse. Because you need to, at that difficult time, your wife will be saying, but uh, Lawrence, did you say God tell you you will do this? You say, you say, go for it, you will do it. She start prophesying back into your life. Go for it. But if you didn't share it with her, she cannot prophesy anything to you. She begin to prophesy back to you. So you need to share it. So I was in the car. My mother was in the car. And we were going somewhere. I was driving. My wife was in the front. When this thing comes on me, I speak. Because the Bible says Jesus Christ is the high priest of our profession. Our profession is our confession. We were in the car. I said, Che, time is running out on me. My mother said, what is the problem? I said, mom, two more years, two, I will be a millionaire. My mother said, please, Cosmas, please. <laughs> please. I said, mom, what is the problem? He said, you know, I tell you, when you start, this is your boast to make me go to the toilet. Let's, let's go to this journey peacefully. When you drop me, you continue to boast. Because for my mother, it was a boast. I stopped the car, wind the glass down. I get to my mother. I say, Mom, two more years. Two. I'll be a millionaire. Because I was like a lady that is pregnant. I was pregnant with my vision. And my mother wanted me to commit abortion. The kingdom of God sovereign violence. And the violence take it by force. When you are pregnant with your vision, let no, let no man, let no woman make you have a spiritual abortion. I went away. On my honor, I made my first two million United States dollar at the age of 24. Not Naira. Come to my house, go to Newi, the place I still live today in Newi. I built it before I turned 25. I built that house before my first son was born. And my firstborn was born on the 26th. I still live in that house. I made money early. The rest is history. Where I live in Ikoyi, I moved there when I turned 40 years. This God we are talking about can take a beggar and make him a king. But you need to follow the principle of his word. God bless you.